Oh, hello, come in. Hi, come in, just having have a seat. That's George. George is relaxing as well as me. He's decided my jumper makes a nice headrest. Got his left paws over some poetry. Ah, oh, well, I'm... Just finishing a meditative pipe here. It's a lovely, lovely old Peterson, um, which uh, was a commemorative thing for, I think, something like the 200th anniversary of a, a shop in Dublin. Anyway, um, I've been thinking a lot recently uh, about Keats, uh, partly because 2021 is the 200th anniversary of his death, and partly because Keats just comes back to me every so often. And there's one of his poems I thought I'd share with you. It's um, I think it's another one of these poems where uh, lockdown and the whole experience and the kind of fearfulness that this pandemic has produced produced in that sense, you know, of our own mortality, but also of the intensity of life. Uh, Keats is always the right person for that. So let's um, come over here. I've just, um, I've got quite a few different editions of Keats. Um, this is a lovely, lovely blue Oxford leather one, and I've got a beautiful one um, uh, that was a present from a friend. And I've got this one in two volumes. I'm gonna take the first volume of this one down. Uh, let me show this to you. This is uh, uh, the Florence Press, and this is a two-volume from 1924. Very beautifully, beautifully produced. Uh, it's lovely paper. It's wonderful type, and it's bound in vellum. And I come out and see. I. You don't have to have luxuriously bound books and you know you have to wait and save for them and find them but Keats is one of those poets where I feel you really um you need to read Keats is so rich so luscious so sensual so full and replete in his poetry that he almost begs to be beautifully bound and 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 ordered like this um you know you don't want to read Keats off a flat screen anyway I, I want to read you a sonnet of Keats which he put into a, a letter which he wrote around this time of year, actually. It was in late January in, in 1818 to his friend Reynolds, where he was pretty clearly feeling quite depressed and feeling anxious. His brother, Tom, had, you know, tuberculosis, this respiratory disease, of which, of course, from which, of course, Keats himself would die only um, three years later after that letter. And he'd been nursing his brother. And he was also saying, he's saying, I can't write. You know, I, I've got all this stuff I feel I want to write, but I can't quite. He knows it's all there. And then in the midst of a letter, a beautifully written letter, in which he says he's struggling to write, he writes down this poem, which is a poem expressing the fear that he's not going to make it through enough life to write all the things he knows could be written. And actually in the very act of sort of despairing about how much he's got or not got to say, he suddenly gives these extraordinarily rich images of what there is to write and of what books themselves are like. And of course we read it with a great sense of poignancy because we know that eventually, probably catching it from the brother he was nursing, um, he himself came to suffer from tuberculosis and, and did die in, in, in 1821. But of course we also read it with this poignancy that between this poem in um, 19, eight, in uh, 1818, which um, was, he was just beginning to come into his powers. He hadn't fully achieved them yet. But that the following couple of years, I mean, the following year, particularly 1819, would be an annus mirabilis in which he would write the greatest of his poetry and some of the greatest poetry, in, not only in English, but in any language. And this is kind of on the cusp of it. Uh, let me read you this sonnet. I think it's just remarkable. When I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high piled books in charactery hold like rich garners the full ripened grain, when I behold upon night the night's starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance, and think 
that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance. And when I feel, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love, then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think till love and fame till nothingness to nothingness do sink oh what a poem an extraordinary final image of um, on on the shore of the wide world i stand alone and think <laughs> i'm sure we've all felt that and maybe felt that you know particularly in this lockdown and surely we've also felt that opening line when i have fears that i may cease to be i guess we're in a race at the moment between um you know, between the injection and the infection, as it were, and we're, you know, I haven't had my my vaccine yet. I don't suppose I'll have it till maybe May or June, and meantime the thing's spreading and we're all trying to shield and, you know, uh, somehow Keats' his own frank confession of his fears, again, as a respiratory illness, can give voice to mine and then make me feel better about them because, you know, look at what poetry Keats, Keats found in them. So there's that. And then there's the, I mean, as a poet, I uh, obviously I'm thinking I've got certain poems I want to write and will I eventually write them. The imagery he gives in this poem for what poetry is, look at this. Um, so when I have fears that I may cease to be, before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, the idea that you're you know, your brain is teeming, it's full of possibilities. And the word gleaning, I mean, gleaning is a wonderfully modest word. Because gleaning is what you do along the edges of the fields, you know, after the harvesters have been, the, Ruth is the gleaner, you know, and he brings Ruth into one of his later major poems. Um, you know, Ruth, when sick for home, she stood in tears amidst the alien corn. The gleaner goes along and gets what they can, you know, that's left. That's a very modest account of what writing might be. But then it's transformed in the next couple of lines. Before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high-piled books in charactery hold like rich garners the full ripened grain. The metaphor there is fantastic. Talk about high-piled books. I, mean, <laughs> I was slightly concerned about these high-piled books. Um, actually, these are in a way gleanings. This is precisely all these books here are my poetry notebooks. They're the notebooks that I write half-written poems in and beginnings of sonnets, and I can see the early drafts of things I later worked on and published, and I can see a gleaning, a leaving, something that I couldn't quite work on then, but I can go back to. But of course, Keats is thinking about the high piled books, the, the the full books, when all the gleaning's been brought in, and it's, there really is they're, this lovely, they're rich garners the full ripened gain. I mean, this poem is a bit of a gleaning, but soon he really would be filling the rich garners with full ripened grain. In the next year, in 18, 19 and 20, he was going to write great poetry. And I suppose this book, this beautifully bound book, is one of those rich garners. So um, that's extraordinary. Um, and the way he talks then, look at this further about the writing. So, when I behold upon the night starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance and think that I may ne live, never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance. That's a beautiful account of, of what it is to write poetry and especially the later wonderful story romantic ballads that he would write like the Eve of St Agnes um, the very next year. In fact, it was exactly a year later after this poem that he was writing the Eve of St Agnes. Uh, that fairy high romance. And um, I love the idea that you look up at the stars and the clouds and they're so suggestive. And that you're tracing the magic shadows, the shadows, the ideas, the images. You're tracing their shadows with the magic hand of chance, the sense that there's chance as well as choice in poetry, that you yourself quite don't quite know how the poem is going to work out. So there's that. And then there's the sheer structure of the poem. Do you see, you can see Shakespeare in the very, as he see Keats in the very act of learning, you know, when I have fears that I may cease to be, that's one section, then another section beginning, when I behold upon the night starred face, another beautiful part of the sonnet, and then, and when I feel, fair creature of an hour, now he's turning to address the girl he loves and saying, 
what if I can't see you? <coughs> Never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love. That when, 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 and then all the never, never, never. You know where he's getting this from. In fact, let's look at where he's getting it from. He's learning from the best. I've got this lovely image of Shakespeare here. Keats felt that Shakespeare was his muse, or his, his or not his muse, but his, 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 his presiding genius, that he wanted to follow Shakespeare. That was given to me by the great Northern Irish uh, uh, artist, Ross Wilson. He called it Well-Read Shakespeare, and it's got all the letters of the... If you come have a look at this, it's got all the... The letters of the alphabet, Shakespeare's tools, as it were, in 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 there. Um, anyway, uh, I have an image, an image of Shakespeare here, and Keats had a little bust of Shakespeare. But let's we'll put this down for a second, and let's go back to this shelf, and we'll get out Shakespeare's sonnets. This is that beautiful edition I showed you that belonged to my um, father-in-law with the C.S. Lewis letter in it, um, and. Um, Let's see uh, if we can we can find. Look, here's Sonnet Twelve, and you'll see exactly the same structure and the same winds. And Shakespeare, Shakespeare has given Keats a pattern from which to work. When I do clamp the clock that tells the time, and feel, see the brave day sunk in hideous night. When I behold the violet past prime, and sable curls or silvered o'er with white, when lofty trees I see barren of leaves, which erst from heat did canopy the herd, and summer's green all girded up in sheaves, borne on the beer with white and bristly beard, then of thy beauty do I question make, that thou amongst the wastes of time must go, since sweets and beauties do themselves forsake and die as fast as they see others grow. And nothing against time's scythe can make defence, save breed to brave him when he takes the hence. It's the same theme, it's the same wonderful series of whens. And if we think about the high piled books as like the granaries where you find the treasure in the store, it's as though among those high pilot books for Keats is Shakespeare. And then, having read Shakespeare, Keats is enabled to write sonnets himself and add, as it were, to the high pilot books. And uh, the final thing about that image of um, hold the, the high pilot books in character, hold like rich garners the full ripened grain, is to say that poetry is not only golden and beautiful and gleaned from the teeming brain, but that it's nourishing, it's substantial. Keats was nourished by Shakespeare. And I, of course, am nourished by both Shakespeare and Keats. I read Shakespeare and I read Keats, and then I read Shakespeare through Keats. And then, of course, the sonnet is my own chosen form. And I'm able to learn from both, both Shakespeare and Keats in order to make my own sonnets and so I turn again and again to this one where Keats is just coming into his power let's just, I, I know you've got to go so I'll just read it to you again because it's a gorgeous poem and you 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 kind of get it more on the second go so here's this lovely Keats sonnet again when I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high pilot books in character hold like rich garners the full ripened grain when I behold upon the night's starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance and think that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance. And when I feel, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love, then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think to love and fame to nothingness do sink. Astonishing poem. Thanks for dropping by.